Thank you very much for the invite. Uh, let me thank the HRDC for the uh, interaction today on India-China relations. My name is Shrikant Kondapalli. I teach in the Chinese Studies program at Jawaharlal Nehru University. To start with, India-China relations is a very significant topic, partly because they have a huge uh, historical relationship. They call themselves as civilizational states, now in the mold of modern nation states. India and China are also the largest populated countries in the world. With 1.4 billion people in China and 1.2 billion people in India. China is the second largest economy in the world today, while India is the sixth largest economy. Their respective comprehensive national power is also increasing substantially. China is considered to be at the fourth in terms of comprehensive national power, while India is at the level of about sixth position in terms of the CNP. In addition, of course, they are importing a lot of resources from abroad, from the other countries. They are industrializing fast. Their economies are growing substantially. So this suggests that we need to discuss India-China relations today. The bilateral and multilateral format is very important to understand the, bilateral, the relations between the two countries. In the case of India and China, this is the 71st anniversary of establishment of diplomatic relations between the two countries. They have a number of issues at the bilateral level, including the territorial dispute, the Tibet issue, the Kashmir issue. There is also a number of diplomatic engagement policies and differences in relation to the bilateral relations. There is also the ups and downs in the bilateral relations, such as during the 1962 border conflict and recently as well during the Galwan crisis in 2020, where an estimated 20 Indian soldiers were martyred, while China had mentioned about four casualties in this event. On February 26th, the External Affairs Minister, Dr. Jai Shankar, spoke to his Chinese counterpart, and they are now trying to de-escalate the situation on the border. Nevertheless, the territorial dispute is of major significance in the bilateral relations. We have also other issues, such as the concern in terms of the third party role, that is Pakistan or the United States. And then there are issues like South China Sea or the Indian Ocean region. When both India and China established diplomatic relations, between December 1949 to April 1950, there was a discussion in relation to Taiwan, the status of Taiwan, and an India model was proposed at that time. By 1954, both signed the Panchil Agreement, the Five Principles of Peaceful Coexistence, and also India recognized Tibet as part of China. Nevertheless, China has so far not recognized the region of Kashmir as part of India. On the other hand, China had raised the Kashmir issue in the United Nations Security Council. Last two years, there has been a lot of discussion on this issue. So which suggests there has been some demands for the revival or seeking reciprocity for the one China principle that India agreed in the 1950s. Of course, the bilateral relations have seen a number of events, including the number of visits from each other. In 1954, Premier Chauhan Lai came to India. Subsequently, 
Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru, you know, also had visited China. In 1960, Travan Lai visited India once again, three times. Subsequently, after the 1962 border clashes, we have seen a freeze. Till 1976, ambassadorial level exchange between the two sides. Since then, both sides have a number of engagement policies that they have evolved. In fact, till last year, there were about 30 structured dialogue processes at a number of levels. The Prime Minister's office has the national security advisor level discussions with the Chinese side in the special representative format and 22 discussions have taken place between India and China in this format of trying to clarify the line of actual control in the border regions. There is also the Prime Minister, there is an informal summit meeting that happened in Wuhan in April 2018, as well as in Chennai in October 2019. The two informal summit meetings are supposed to bring the two countries' leaders together and enhance the understanding between the two. The External Affairs Ministry has its own strategic dialogue. In that format, they discuss a number of issues. Then the Home Ministry has a counter-terrorism cooperation. The Defense Ministry has an annual defense dialogue since 2006. The HRD Ministry, the Ministry of Education, has a cultural exchange program and a youth exchange. Nearly 100 youth are exchanged between the two sides. The Niti Ayo and its previous institution, the Planning Commission, they have organized the strategic and economic dialogues to look at the macroeconomic picture as the two countries are rising in the international format they thought that the macroeconomic situation need to be discussed. For example, in terms of the investment flows, in terms of currency valuation and flows, and also some kind of cooperation in the BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa format. There are also other cooperative arrangements between India and China. This is reflected in terms of the 2018 10-point agreement for expanding relations in culture, in Chinese language exchanges, teachers exchange, the museum exchange, museum expertise exchange, and in a number of other fields. Of course, the 2020 events have marred the bilateral relations. We have had a situation on the border when since March, April 2020, there has been a mobilization of forces in Pankungso Lake region and also in Galwan, Debsan Plains, Gogra Heights, Nakula in Sikkim or in other areas. So this has vitiated the bilateral relations in 2020 although it appeared with the discussions between the two defense ministers and two foreign ministers, it appears that India and China are getting back to a new normal in bilateral relations. There are also a number of other events at the bilateral level. The economic and trade relations are increasing substantially. Then there is the border trade, which for a long period of time has been scuttled after the 1962 border clashes, but has been now revived through the three passes in Lipu Lake, Shipkila, and in Nathula. There are multilateral interactions between India and China. For instance, in the BRICS format, in the RIC 
Russia, India, China format. In the United Nations, on counterterrorism, on climate change proposals, or, or in other areas, Shanghai Cooperation Organization. In SARC, South Asian Association for Regional Cooperation, East Asian Summit, and others. Both have expressed concern on the intervention from the outside world. So this is broadly the India-China relations. Let me go deeper inside. Let me first explain the vision that China and India have broadly in terms of their aspirations on how they would like to rise. Angus Madison, an economic historian, identified the last 2,000 years of economic rise and fall of nations. 2,000 years ago, India's GDP was more than 60% of the global GDP, while China was around 30 to 40% of the global GDP. Both countries, of course, declined, specifically during the colonial period. Today, both China and India are rising in GDP format, gross domestic product format. China is the second largest economy. India is the sixth largest economy at the moment with $3 trillion GDP. China's aspiration today is influenced by the Communist Party objectives. In 2017, the Communist Party of China announced that they would like to have their rejuvenation and China dream fulfilled. It is not clear what exactly these are. However, they were suggesting to occupying the center stage in regional and global orders. Moreover, China had suggested to building a community of common interests through a Belt and Road Initiative project since 2013. India is focusing on realizing Vikas, or broadly, developmental aspects. India is aspiring to become a $5 trillion economy in the near future, and is focusing on development, economic development. There are a number of schemes that Indian government has launched, including the Atma Nirbhartha campaign, the Skill India, Make in India, Sagar Mala, and a host of other Digital India and other programs. So China's objectives and India's objectives at one level are the same. However, India has not joined the Belt and Road Initiative or the Chinese concept of community of common destiny. As a result, there are differences between the two in terms of how they aspire to continue in their trajectory. Both also have huge economic and military prowess. China has the second largest standing armed forces in the world. They have conventional and nuclear forces, as with India. Of course, they, both of them follow a no first use policy in the nuclear domain. This formidable strength is important for us to understand. Let me now shift to a contentious issue between India and China that sometimes appear to derail the bilateral relations. For instance, the territorial dispute has led to the 1962 conflict and also a number of incidents on the border appear to derail the bilateral relations. Let me briefly explain. The territorial dispute is divided into three sectors, the eastern sector, the middle sector, and the western sector. The eastern sector is in Arunachal Pradesh, where there is a bubbling democratic experiment as well as economic activity that is going currently. While China claims the 
Arunachal Pradesh region and has since 2005 configured Tawang as southern Tibet and by logic is trying to suggest that this is a core interest for China. The Metmohan line was drawn by the British India in 1914 in which the Chinese nationalist representative Chen Yifan and the Tibetan representative Lonchen Shatra attended the meeting and Chen Yifan initialed the McMahon line document suggesting to their acceptance willy-nilly of the McMahon line. However, since 2006, China has been claiming the entire Arunachal Pradesh, not just Tawang, but the entire 90,000 square kilometers in Arunachal Pradesh. Of course, since 1981, there were discussions on the territorial dispute, and both the officials have come down to a few pockets as the most disputed areas, not the entire over 1,000 kilometers of the McMahon line as the disputed area. These include the Asafila area, Lungchu area, fishtails uh, and others, Changzhu, Samdurangchu and others. The middle sector is least controversial, including in Kauril, Shipkila and Barahoti. In June 2000, they, the two sides almost agreed to uh, some kind of a modus vivendi in resolving the middle sector. But since the overall territorial dispute resolution principle is sector by sector approach within a package deal, India suggested to a sector by sector approach while the Chinese have suggested to a package deal. The third sector is the Western sector, which in the last one year has been at the eye of the storm. China last March had mobilized forces in violation of several agreements that India and China have concluded in 1993-1996, 2005-2012 and 2013 for maintaining peace and stability in the border areas and not to conduct military exercises with line of actual control as the strategic focus. There are also several provisions like no-fly zone and others. Last one year, this has been in violation by China. The western sector is over 1,600 kilometers in length and this has become quite controversial as China had been raising the Kashmir issue in the recent times. China has also elevated the controversy by suggesting this area belongs to that of China in terms of its sovereignty. From the previous disputed area to that of sovereignty, China changed its discourse in the Western sector. And as a result, of this, Indian armed forces have to mobilize nearly 90,000 troops since last year. And finally, of course, after 10 rounds of discussions between the two military core commanders, by February this year, in 2021, we have seen a disengagement process. What Raksha Mantri told the parliament, phased, coordinated, and verifiable process of disengagement is in place currently. And hopefully, both sides will get back to discussions on the territorial dispute in the near future. So Western sector, middle sector, Eastern sector are the ones. However, China also raised the Sikkim sector which appear to have been resolved with an 1890 treaty. However, Doklam crisis in 2017 suggested China has been reviving even the Sikkim-related issue. 
just to sum up, there are a number of border related incidents. Let me recount quickly. The, after the 1962 border clashes, we had the Nathula Chola incident in 1967. We also had in 1975 the Tulungla incident in Arunachal Pradesh, which killed a few Assam Rifles soldiers. In 1986-87, the Samdurongchu incident again tried to derail the bilateral relations. 2013 Debsan Plain incident where China Chinese troops marched 19 kilometers inside the Indian claimed area. And then Chumar incident, Barahoti incident, the Nakula incident, and recently the Galwan incident. These suggest that China has been unleashing its forces at will and India needs to do substantially in terms of border management in the near future. At the moment, there has been some discussion on all these. So hopefully, the bilateral relations will get back onto the track. A second contentious issue is Jammu and Kashmir. When Zorawar Singh united Jammu and Kashmir, it was 2,20,000 square kilometers territory. Pakistan sent rangers and currently over 30% of Kashmir is in illegal occupation of Pakistan. In addition, Pakistan also gave up Sakshgam Valley, Agil, Shimshal, Ruksam to China in the 1960s. China is in occupation of over 38,000 square kilometers of Aksai Chin in addition to the land that Pakistan transferred to China. In 1950s, Chinese leaders were conducive to the Indian position on Kashmir by suggesting that the division between India and Pakistan is unnatural, as Mao Zedong suggested to the visiting Vice President Sarvepali Radhakrishnan. Subsequently, as China-Pakistan all-weather friendship improved, China took the position that there should be self-determination for Kashmiris. Subsequently, in the 1980s, as the reform program progressed in China, they mentioned about the line of control sanctity and peaceful resolution of the Kashmir issue based on Shimla agreement. Nevertheless, recently, China has been intervening in Kashmir issue by the CPEC projects, China-Pakistan economic corridor projects. China is, is investing over $42 billion at the moment out of nearly $62 billion. In hydroelectricity dams, in roads, railways, and other infrastructure projects. China has also been mobilizing over 36,000 security guards to protect these from terrorists. Another issue is Tibet. In 1954, India recognized Tibet as part of China without any reciprocal arrangement on Kashmir. In 1988, in 2003, India recognized that Tibet is an autonomous region of China. Today, over 1,60,000 Tibetans are living in India. Many of them are exercising their democratic right in electing their Sikyong. In December 2020, President Trump had signed the TPSA, Tibet Policy Support Act. In terms of sanctioning, the Chinese officials who appoint the 15th Dalai Lama in future. So it appears that Tibet issue is likely to become controversial in the near future. And India has several security concerns in the Trans Himalayan region where there are several monasteries located. 
Another issue between India and China is related to the Indian Ocean, South China Sea and others. China today is entering into the Indian Ocean region through what has been termed as a string of pearls. While China says that it imports nearly 80% of its oil through the Straits of Malaccas passing through the Indian Ocean region, it is setting up bases or port facilities like Gwadar in Pakistan, Hambantota in Sri Lanka. Recently, they also agreed to the signals intelligence facility in, Mauri in Seychelles and they also have opened up in 2015 Djibouti Naval Base. Jimani Base in Pakistan is also set to be under the works. China today is entering into the Indian Ocean region by this logic of dependence on the Malaccas, Malacca dilemma. The other issue is South China Sea and in flagrant violation of the 2016 on clause treaty, United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea, China had been militarizing the South China Sea through which nearly 50% of Indian trade is passing through. So India has been supportive of the freedom of navigation and overflight. And after the INS Airavat incident in 2009, India has been at the forefront in protecting the maritime rights and interests in the South China Sea. As China is trying to put across the Indian Ocean strategy and the Pacific Ocean strategy, India has been increasingly aligning itself with the Indo-Pacific idea floated in 2017, as well as the Quadrilateral Security Dialogue the Quadrilateral Security Dialogue saw three foreign ministerial meetings in February 2021. The third meeting has been, has been held. The Quadrilateral Security Dialogue also conducted two military naval exercises in 2007 as well as in 2020 November. It appears that India, US, Japan, and Australia are likely to continue with the quadrilateral security dialogue naval exercises. China terms this in a uh, in terms of a C form or expresses concern about any containment, although it has continued the military militarization in the South China Sea, posing concerns to the neighborhood posing concerns to several countries. Let me quickly turn to the visits that are uh, undertaken to each other. Uh, as I mentioned before, Chauvin Lai came to India in 1954, followed by Jawaharlal Nehru's visit, the first Prime Minister of India. However, after the 62 war, both sides have gone into a huddle. There were no visits for a long time. On an average, we saw 10 years once visits by Chinese presidents to India since the 1990s, after Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi's visit in 1988. So we have had the visits by President Chiang Zemin in 1996. We have also seen uh, President Hu Jintao and President Xi Jinping's visits in 2006 and in 2014. From Indian leaders' visits, we see Prime Minister P.V. Narasimha Rao received Premier Li Peng. They signed the Peace and Tranquility Agreement. The visits by the subsequent Prime Ministers Prime Minister Vajpayee in 2003, by Dr. Manmohan Singh later, and Prime Minister Modi in 2015. All of these tried to expand the bilateral relations uh, in various domains. And as we discussed before, there are some 30 
engagement processes at various levels, ministries and others. As a result today, the bilateral economic and trade relations increased from a pretty low of $260 million of bilateral trade. Today, they have reached over $87 billion in 2020, despite the COVID-19 related supply chain mechanism disruption. Of course, the 2005 target of $100 billion has not been reached so far. Nevertheless, trade increased substantially. One concern that China, India expressed in economic relations is the increasing trade deficit. Although it is a function of demand and supply and market mechanism, the trade deficits between India and China in favor of China is nearly $900 billion. That is, China's balance of payments position is in favor, in its favor, while India lost so much in China trade. In order to curb this bilateral trade deficit, India suggested that China needs to invest more, although it remains only about $8.2 billion right now. Secondly, opening up of the China market for Indian pharmaceuticals and software products, removing the non-tariff barriers, and also utilizing the third market for exports. There are some mechanisms which have come in, the financial dialogue, the, the steel dialogue, the uh, renminbi, rupee exchange, uh, high-speed railway construction, and a number of others, although progress has been very tardy on those. The bilateral economic relations have also spilled into the multilateral field where India raised objections in joining the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement in Bangkok in 2019. And last year, the RCEP came into being. Although India has several free trade area agreements, the SEPA agreement with South Korea, with Japan, the ASEAN free trade area and so on. So with a majority of the RCEP countries, India already has free trade agreements. However, China has been putting pressure on India to open up for its markets. Uh, we see that this is an issue of concern for India in the longer term. China has also concluded an investment deal with European Union, indirectly putting pressure at the macroeconomic situation on India. Uh, let me quickly turn to, uh, after these visits, to the informal summit meetings, which is a mechanism that was tried since the Wuhan meeting in 2018 and the Chennai meeting in 2019. A number of issues were discussed. The hope was if the highest level leaders are informed of the problems, they would be able to resolve the issues between the two sides. Nevertheless, despite the informal summit meetings, last year, India was rudely awoken with the Chinese troops marching into the western sector of the border uh, and consequently leading to the mobilization of over 1,50,000 troops in all. The Chinese about 60,000 and Indian side about 90,000 troops. This of course is now under control with the disengagement process. And there has been a, a gradual increase in the discussions between the two defense ministers as well as the foreign ministers. Let me thank you for your attention.